Um, but there's nobody that knows more about that or has probably been working on it longer than our next speaker, who is Nathan Zeldis. He is the founder and president of the Information Overload Research Group. Uh, so I've been working with him side by side, although he's been in Israel, um, a dutiful leader from many time zones away um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this group. And uh, he worked on this at Intel for a number of years. How many years were you there, Nathan? 26 years. Well, I've been in this space for a while, but 26 years ago, <laughs> yeah, I was more in the preschool. <laughs> okay, I will, I will take that advice, but I'll take a lot more of your advice. Um, in this next session, he's going to talk about 20 years of I.O. solutions. I guess in the first six years, you were creating problems. Is that? <laughs> well, well, we'll learn about that. Sorry, I can't make jokes if you don't have a microphone. So um, with, with that, I will hand it over to Nathan as our closing talk. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to review the evolution of the solution landscape over these 20 years that I've been at it. And it's really a case of evolution. I mean, we started in the primordial muck and things moved from there in various interesting directions. I will also share some insights from this work I've done on this definitive guide of information overload solutions that uh, I put a copy here for people to look at because it was a slow, long process creating that, so it also gives us information in time. So we'll talk about solutions past, present, and future. Here's uh, the first solution to email that I came to. This is Lotus CC Mail, as uh, deployed at Intel. Uh, interestingly, do I have a pointer or a laser or something? The pointer is the green one. Yeah, I got one of those. Here, one feature in Lotus CC Mail that's missing to this day. Previous message, next message, trash this message. Previous message and trash this one, you know, and trash it and move to the next one. These two buttons are extremely useful, completely missing in Outlook. So you're the Microsoft guy. So tell them when they fixed everything else, this one, okay? I mean, I was teaching people that because it does cut the time, halves the time to delete and move forward. Anyway, what have we got here? In 1994, Intel deployed Lotus CC Mail as a, a wide-scale email. I mean, before that, the geeks had their thing in Unix and so on, but uh, the large population at Intel had nothing. Also in 1994, I became computing productivity manager at Intel. Not because Andy Grove said, oh my God, we need a computing productivity manager, because I needed a new job, and I invented this one for myself. Uh, it seemed to make sense at the time, actually. And the same year, email overload hit the fan. It was amazing, it, like they just deployed the, the application, the email application, and within a few months, I was getting rumors that managers are refusing to open their email, I mean, that bad. So I started uh, talking to them and interviewing them, and I realized that they have absolutely no skills in using the email application, that there was absolutely no etiquette standards, of course, and uh, the application itself was pretty weak and lacked useful features for coping with the overload. Uh, there was one solution at that time. It was called Outside In. It was an attachment viewer. So you could preview your attachment with, and uh, CCML was uh, a modal. So you know, it would freeze when you were looking at one attachment. This one got around that, so I got it on, on diskettes and actually paid for a corporate license and delivered it. Everything else we had to develop in-house, the etiquette standards, the training, the expectations, the skill training on how to use the application, and we did, and by the year 2000, we had what we called Your Time, which was a corporate-wide program that went top-down across the entire corporation and gave people the skills, the tools, the, the etiquette, expectations, the group training, and so on, uh, which worked fairly well. And then the word got out. Fast Company Magazine uh, interviewed me about it, and they accidentally published my email in the interview in print. So now I got, like, maybe a hundred different organizations contacted me, and that included everybody from the US Army to the Salvation Army, literally both, and everything in between. So it became clear to me that this is a big problem. I started talking to the, the people who wrote to me that were perhaps smarter than some of the others, and uh, over the next few years, other companies did things similar to my program, some copying it, others on their own. We started talking to each other. 
So in the next decade, we had a second round of in-house solution development at Intel, uh, and at BP. BP was one of the strongest partners I had in this space. The idea is what you see up there, you can see the original uh, mock-up, right? And of course, they wouldn't let me do that, so instead we did uh, this one here. We had a tool that would uh, pop up alerts on a whole bunch of different etiquette mistakes you could make and give you the opportunity to fix them, uh, which worked actually. We developed the tool, it worked well, we deployed it across Intel, some other companies copied it, it was fine. To me, this was the beginning of what I call technology-assisted behavior change, which is, yeah, you talk to them, you teach them, you educate them, but it's not bad if, if you know, the mouse is electrified and gives them a little shock at the right moment. Uh, Meanwhile, the market awakened. I mean, clear context, I don't know if they were literally the first, but in 2003, they got started. And they, and then many others, came with all these automated uh, sorting tools for email and classifiers and so on. And uh, there was growing attention from researchers, both in academia and in the industry. And there was more startups, and there was a lot of action. So by July 2008, we founded uh, iWork officially, incorporated it. So we have this group since then which is all the same process. The, this leak in Fast Company is what got me to talk to all these people that later came to be active in IOC. So that is the history. And as you see, it starts with absolutely nothing. And then slowly you see things growing. Now I'll talk about the present. And here I want to show you the statistics from my definitive guide, which you know it's a, a kind of encyclopedic catalog of all the solutions I know of. And the beauty is I started it a few years ago two and a half years ago, uh, for somebody that asked me for this list of solutions. Then I let it rest for a while. Then I decided to productize it and update it and, and put it up for sale on my website. So we have two versions of the same thing, one building on the other, with two and a half years between them. And now you can see the data. And you can see that the number of solutions, uh, which you know worked very hard to include every solution I can possibly imagine or heard of, went up 44% in two and a half years. You can see that the software tools went up 78%. And this is actually because the common sense solutions in behavior space, like don't be an idiot, don't do email all day. Yeah, that was covered already in the first version, probably. Uh, it's not like all the, the rise was from uh, software tools, but much of it was. The automatic classifiers, meanwhile, didn't go up all that much. We have other software tools that are not classifiers that totally exploded. So my conclusion from this is we have a big jump in the number of solutions, especially in software tools. And the software came of age and stopped being everybody copying each other's tool that does classification. Instead, we have a huge diversity of very different tools out there in software space. Here's the taxonomy of solutions I have there. I'm not going to read them to you. But just you can see there's, there's six categories if you count miscellaneous. And there's a whole bunch of subcategories. So we have Solutions doing many, many different, totally diverse things. You know, there's personal strategies like we discussed here. There's bans and quotas and posted charges on email. That never caught well, but there were some attempts there. There's interruption control through agreement. There's interruption control through, through software tools. As you'll see, there's interruption control through uh, brain connections. We'll get there, and so on. And here are some observations I want to share with you. First of all, there is a new kind of email out there. It used to be it was all about Outlook or, or CC mail. These days, we have webmail and Gmail and all that they're brothers. And uh, this is taking over from Outlook and Exchange as the main thing. And that is perhaps because it's so much easier to do something with Gmail than it is with, with Exchange in a large corporation. So there are some solutions actually addressing uh, Exchange, but less. Then there's new devices. Of course, mobile products have a major presence in this space now. And there are new vendors, which is all these bold new startups that are pushing the envelope. Some of them even survive. And the beauty of it is, it's so, well, I won't say it's easy to be a startup. Of course, you need tremendous courage. But uh, it's possible to, to bring up an app that's going to cost a few dollars. And anyone can do it, as opposed to bringing up a company that will develop a competitor for Microsoft or something like that. So the, the en environment we operate in uh, from a human perspective is completely different. Lots of young people doing lots of different and interesting things. Uh, there's new markets because you don't need to attack the enterprise in order, in order to succeed. You can start with Gmail. Then you may or may not 
choose to go after the enterprise. You may be successful and not want to even go in that direction because getting things into the enterprise is a huge hassle. I mean, when I began, let me tell you, I had beautiful red hair and look at me after 20 years of trying to push Intel to adopt all these solutions. So it's difficult. Uh, although some companies do actually try to attack the, the enterprise, I would say they have plans. I haven't seen many that, that have panned out, but they are thinking about how they might possibly do that. And there are lots of amazing new creative ideas. So I'm giving you a very small sample just to, to give you the diversity. For instance, there's this startup Sintomo in Israel from some guys from Tel Aviv University that is in beta. And it summarizes the entire email thread and presents it as a chat. It looks like a chat on a smartphone. So you know, a few words for each party. And then it allows you to manage the entire chat as a single object in various useful ways. There's Email Valet, which is a research project from Stanford, which is a client that uses remote assistance, crowdsourcing assistance, you know, the, the Elance type assistance, to actually work through people's email and annotate the tasks that they have to do. Now you'd think that would never work because nobody would be willing. But we see a number of solutions that, that do this sort of thing and they have tools to strip out your credit card information if it's there and so on. So it's an interesting concept. There's my focus in Canada, in beta, which has uh, three buttons. One is a big physical thing like this, a small cup of coffee in size that can glow in red or green on your desk and ties to your machine, and one on your uh, email on your machine and one on your email on your smartphone. And they're all synchronized. And if you move any of them to be red, then all your email and, and social media stop bothering you until you turn it green. Meanwhile, your coworkers see the red light on your desk. So if they pop in, they pop right out again. Interesting. Then there is the solution of uh, no interruption zones and no interruption where, which is uh, some serious attempts in situations where interruptions are deadly, such as hospitals or airplanes, to mark where interruptions will not be tolerated. So you know, if I'm standing here, you can interrupt. If I'm standing here, in that hospital, you may not interrupt me because I'm probably a nurse mixing medicines. And there's actually markings, like red marks on the floor and everything, to make that work. And there is the interesting solution from Ford, which has interrupt-free driving. They have some car models where they have a do not disturb button. You know, my dream to have those buttons everywhere. And uh, what they do with the button is you push the button, and suddenly you can't get cell phone calls if the vehicle is moving. Interesting, too. And there's a lot more. As to the future, uh, I'll just show you a couple of thoughts about things that may be relevant to the future. Predicting the future is a risky business. First of all, there's the question of eliminating email, which everybody says, no, you can't eliminate email. And certainly email is not going anywhere soon. But I would say, look at these guys. I mean, look at Luis Suarez from, was in IBM, and Professor Jones in the University of North Carolina. They eliminated email completely, and the only way to communicate with them is through Twitter, basically. Works great for them. Uh, they were in a webinar at iOrg, and you have the address here. You can go see a recording of the whole webinar. These guys were also represented there. This is Atos in France, which is a huge multinational IT company. And famously, they are eliminating email internally completely. But the way they are doing it is smart. I have nine hours and 45 minutes. Okay, cool. What? No problem. Okay. So the thing with Atos is that their CEO, which is this older guy, who is a serious player, I mean, he used to be a government minister, I think, and a bunch of things, decided two or three years ago that he's going to eliminate email pollution inside the company the way he eliminated physical pollution, you know, green type pollution. But he didn't uh, do the knee-jerk thing where he says, from tomorrow I'm refusing to read any emails. What he did is set up a whole business unit, a small unit, to drive the process. He set a deadline of three years, and they're moving department by department across the entire organization, eliminating email by understanding the processes email is serving and replacing them. They actually developed social media tools, and they just spun off the company that does that. And what you see in the picture here is this Monsieur Breton, the CEO, giving a zero email certificate to these two folks whose department has just been certified email free officially. So they are doing it similar to the way you would do an ISO certification, which is interesting. So just as food for thought, 
We'll see what happens to all these guys. They're still a tiny minority, but who knows? Maybe we'll learn something. Another thing I'd love to see is better contextual interruption management, which is a favorite kind of solutions with me, and not enough is happening there. In fact, in the mainstream, we had Microsoft research. We had priorities, which uh, was a cool product. I mean, what it did is say, Jared is phoning me, and the thing is saying, okay, Nathan is now in a meeting because he sees it in my calendar. He's talking because he hears it in the microphone. And uh, in the past, whenever Jared emailed him, he didn't give a damn. So this is not a good time to move Jared's phone call to Nathan's awareness. Therefore, we'll move into voicemail now. Maybe later, we'll see. So this tool is looking at the context of your application, what you're doing, your deadlines and everything, every second, and routes everything accordingly, which is so cool, right? The problem is that they showed it to me in 2005 or six. Okay, the paper is from 2003. They are not releasing it. Now we have a spy inside Microsoft. You can find out why. I mean, my theory is somebody said, oh, the icon for this is green. That would dilute the Excel brand or something. But it's very sad because this is an extremely valid product. In fact, Morgan Stanley developed a similar thing internally on their own, which they're using. So I'd love to see that or somebody else doing that. Meanwhile, at the bleeding edge, we have this uh, guy, Ruggiero Scorcioni, who is a neurophysiologist or something like that in San Diego University. And uh, he developed the brain electrode inter uh, interruption moderating thing. You see him there. What happened to him is he was at a hackathon where everybody, or maybe the first 100 people who got there, got this uh, funny thing with the cat ears and the electrode, where if you think hard, then the ears perk up, which is you know, a cool toy for teenagers. Well, what he decided to do in the hackathon is hack the thing and create a tool where if you're busy thinking, then your uh, cell phone calls go to voicemail. And the thing works. And he got the first prize, which was, I don't know, 50 or $30,000. And he left the university, so he's a really courageous guy, and started a startup called Brainino to, to commercialize this technology. So that's contextual interruption management at its best. We'll see what happens, but it's an interesting direction too. Lastly, there is the question of improving the email protocol. So, you know, the statement is email was invented in the 60s, surely it's time to do something else. And Paul Graham, you know, uh, the, the venture capitalist and famous blogger, uh, made this statement that it's going to be impossibly difficult to replace the protocol but ultimately it will be replaced, so why not do it now, right? And what he proposed in his article was email is really a to-do tool. It brings in tasks, even if the task is just to read or to reply, but most of it is really a series of emails about, are about getting stuff into my task queue. Therefore, the protocol should have the metadata and, and whatever it takes to allow negotiating these tasks with the recipient in various ways, which is a cool idea. Then there's Joshua Baer of Other Inbox who had this uh, drive to uh, institute a protocol for self-destructing emails, so with a, an expiration date, which would be extremely useful for reducing information overload. I don't think that is going anywhere at the moment, but there was some discussion around that. And all I can say is, yeah, it's a good idea to look at these protocols. Uh, we must remember that not everything works. For instance, you know this, this is Google Wave, that's where I took that quote from, right? They were very eager and it failed for various, perhaps, good reasons. So I'm not saying we should do all these things. I am saying maybe the future is going to bring changes in the email protocol itself. In fact, uh, to paraphrase Graham, in the year 3000, yeah, email is going to be different. So the question is only when. And we have an accelerating rate. And in 2045, we have the singularity. And then computers will take over. And I assure you that computers are not going to be paying people a salary for working half a week because of email overload. So they're going to do something about it. Okay, last point. I said the previous one was the last one, so I was mistaken. Last point is I'm beginning to see more awareness from, from my clients, from companies, about the nature of the problem. They're no longer saying, oh my God, we got lots of email. They're saying, oh my God, we got a, a collapse of our internal communication culture. And that is so true, of course, and that's the reason underlying all of this. And it's very encouraging that, that 
they're looking at that, that they're saying it up front before me even having to tell them, and some of them are even willing to do something about it. And we need a lot more of that. So that's one direction where we need to take solutions to where they address culture and not email. And of course, maybe they won't have a choice much longer because they will crumble and die if they don't do something about their problem. Okay, uh, is this where I ask for questions before concluding the session? Questions? Actually, it's not a question, but a statement. For some of you know, thank you. Some of you know that um, Basics published a research report on Intel's information overload activities, which at the time, we in 2007, we sold for, I think, uh, 999. Um, Anyone here who's attending who would like a copy of that report, just tell me, uh, give me your card, and just write Intel on the card, and I will be happy to send you a complimentary copy. Thank you. Now you're going to see all my trials and tribulations at Intel. Okay. All right, so, closing thoughts. Other questions? I, or oh. Were you handing it over to questions, I thought? <laughs> questions. So you say that your smarter clients, are, or some of your clients, are realizing that it's more of a cultural problem as opposed to a generic information overload problem. Does that change how you address it with them? Uh, well, the way it works is this. If they are not willing to address the culture problem, then there's nothing I can do, right? Because they're the boss, they're the customer, they're always right. As soon as they let me get a foot in the door on the culture, yeah, that's what I try to address because it's, I mean, I've been lecturing it for, for years. Doing that is going possibly to help in a serious way. Installing minor solutions here and there, or you know, posters in the conference room saying don't send unnecessary email. Okay, that's fine. It's better than nothing, and it's cheap. They can do that, but uh, we need to go deep and wide, is, is what I call it. You know, wide is whole culture, and deep is look at the underlying uh, issues, which are all deep in, in the murky part of the culture. You know, the, the mistrust in the organization, and, and all the, the cover your ass, and the, all, all the, the stuff they need to address. And can I just ask a quick follow-up to that? What's that? As a quick follow-on to that, is it something that can be done top-down, or does the cultural change need to occur from the base and go up, or can it be enforced top-down? Uh, I would say, in general, cultural change needs to go top-down. The way I, I distinguish is any solution that will make you go through your inbox faster, everybody is willing to sign up for that. Any solution that will make you behave by not sending your colleagues a necessary email, where your interest is to send it, right, because you want them to notice you, has to come top down. It's, it's, I always say it's a game theory thing. It's, it's a prisoner's dilemma. And only management can change the payoff table of the prisoner's dilemma in an organization. Other, Other questions? For Mr. Zaldas. Uh, when you say top down, who in the organization is typically the driver of uh, this change? Uh, well, ideally, you would want to have the CEO. In practice, you can probably afford to make it one level below that. Uh, an interesting observation I once heard is that the CIO is the last person you want because their interest is to keep the business running, no viruses, and that's it. But the CFO may be a, a, an interested party because all this waste goes to money, basically. Okay, CFO is probably the yeah. best. Well, interestingly, just to that point, there's now a lot more CTOs than there were in the past. A lot of government agencies in particular used to have only CIOs. Right. Now they have CTOs, which are starting to focus on that That's side of the That's a point. Also, house. HR managers, by the way, tend they to be They just don't involved. have clout, <laughs> but they should. Okay. Um, other questions? You know what? Hey, I'm the speaker, and I decree that there will be no more questions. Come on. Okay, let's move Let on. Let it be done. Closing thoughts. It's for all of us. Concluding thoughts. Both. This is not about my, my speech here, this is about today. And uh, I really want to say it's great having you here. Um, traveling quite far, although Nina kind of stole my thunder on that. But uh, it's a long trip and I really like to make it because I meet all these people here when I make it to, to this place. And I want to point out to you what you and me and all of us can do once we all go home to help keep things going in the right direction. One thing you can do is get the word around about IORC and what it's doing. Uh, these days, the barriers to entry into IORC have been reduced very considerably. You no longer need to pledge half your future salary or, or mortgage your house. You don't need to do anything, actually, except you know go on our mailing list or something. 
but get the word around so people know about our mailing list and what's going on. Uh, one other thing you can do is share your data. The data, your thoughts, your results, your findings with the rest of us, with each other. And uh, you can share it with the rest of the people interested in this in the world by submitting it to us for dissemination through our newsletter. So this is a, a fairly benign newsletter. It goes out every few months. But if you submit an article or something that's of interest, we will gladly upload it to our server and issue the word around for people to know. You can certainly collaborate with each other, and I'm sure some of you will be doing that. I know I'm still doing that since the original uh, IORC founding uh, conference. And you can contribute content to the Information Overload uh, Resource Center, which is informationoverloadresources.com. Uh, that is a, a list of pointers, basically all about the pointers, there's no files there. And uh, you're definitely encouraged to put anything related to information overload, pointers to articles, to blog posts, books, stuff you've written, whatever. Just contribute it, we have it moderated more or less, and we will put it up there. And you can step up and join us on the steering team or executive committee or the board or whatever you want to call us. But we do have a team that meets about twice a month usually to get things moving, and we decide on what to do, which is usually some webinars, the resource center, and this annual conference. And anyone that feels like joining us, we will definitely welcome the addition of new blood into this. What else? Propose, it says, suggest, critique, volunteer. Make us a better organization. To do that, just write me, and we'll discuss it. But uh, it would be great if you did, actually. I think each year we have somebody joining or doing something significant as a result of this. So we don't know which of you it's going to be, but we will find out. And if there's two of you, that's good, too. That counts as a concluding thoughts? That's wonderful insight from the founder. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, and actually, for the other folks that are on that board that he was just speaking of, if you wouldn't mind just coming up here just so folks know who you are. Joshua, Jonathan, Marty. Anybody I'm missing? Charlie couldn't make it here today, but just uh, check out these folks and email them and not me if you're interested in getting involved. <laughs> I am done. Just let the video reply. His email is no reply, I will. There you go.